All right. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, so a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, depending on where in the world you're tuning in from. Thank you for being here. I'm Michelle Lowe from the New York office of the Singapore Global Network. And I have with me here today my colleague in Singapore, Huang Baohui. The Singapore Global Network is part of the Singapore Economic Development Board, and we help to grow the networks of Singaporeans and friends, fans and family around the world. So whether you are a Singaporean abroad or a non-Singaporean who's lived in Singapore before, we want to get connected with you. We've moved our events online during this period, and we're so glad that you can join us today. So before we start the webinar, a few housekeeping items. In the Q&A box, you can share with us your questions and also upvote others. A recording will be posted on our YouTube channel, and we'll also reach out to you for your thoughts after the session. So keep a lookout for that in your inbox. Lastly, for those of you in tech, I'll be making an announcement at the end of the event about the special community that the Singapore Global Network has set up. So stay tuned for that. All right, now on to the event proper. This webinar is of course titled, Preparing for the Future of Work. And it's the third session of a series of tech talks called Pizza and Prata that the Singapore Global Network was running in New York before the pandemic hit. We're very pleased to have with us here today four really great speakers and fellow Singaporeans. We have um, with us Ian Goh, Director of Product at AIML Startup, Perceptive Automator in Boston, here in the US. We have Sarah Liu, Singapore Public Sector Leader at Masa and Future of Work Fellow at the World Economic Forum in Geneva, Switzerland. Juliet Lim, co-founder of boutique search firm Opa Search, who's currently in Chicago, US. And Jeffrey Tiong, founder and CEO of PetStep, a leading connected innovation intelligence B2B software solutions company. So four speakers, uh, four time zones, and here we are all today. So hi guys. Can we have you do a quick introduction of yourselves, your current role and company? Uh, Ian, do you want to kick things off? Ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, I think uh, Michelle, you'll need to unmute each of us uh, one by one. But thanks, Michelle. Uh, so I'll give a quick introduction. Uh, I'm Ian Goh, very nice to meet all of you. Uh, so I think from a super high level, I have had a variety of product and strategy roles in the tech industry broadly, and more specifically within deep tech and mobility. And I just want to give you sort of like a quick flavor of what my career has been like, um, so that you get a sense of you know, why maybe there's some things that uh, I might have a decent perspective on. So I think I see my career as pretty typical of Silicon Valley. I've had my share of ups and downs. I've been at companies large and small, successful and unsuccessful. Um, so a few highlights. Uh, I spent a few years at Bain ex advising executives at some top Silicon Valley tech giants, and you know those led to some significant multi-billion dollar acquisitions and strategic shifts. So yeah, that's pretty. It was pretty cool. But on the other hand, I've also been part of a, a layoff at a connected car startup that didn't manage its cash burn right. Uh, on the positive side, I have been part of an EV infrastructure company that raised more than a billion dollars but then ended up failing pretty spectacularly. Um, one other experience I had was at Newtonomy. I was an early employee. This was a self-driving car startup that was spun out of MIT. Um, and back in the day, I think it was 2016, we hit the front page of the Wall Street Journal for launching the first robotaxi trials in the world. And this was you know, in our very own Singapore. So that was certainly like a big memorable event for me. Um, at some point, the company then went through an acquisition. We became part of this large organization, more than 100,000 employees. And so and that comes with its own pros and cons. Um, now I am leading product that, as Michelle said, an AI ML startup, we're looking to build what's called human intuition for machines. Um, so hopefully that gives you a flavor, you know, ups and downs, as I said, large and small companies. I, I don't see myself as an expert on this topic at all, but, uh, and also, you know, my perspective, I think has been quite narrow compared to the whole economy, but hopefully Hopefully, I'll be able to provide at least um, a little bit of a contribution to this discussion. And I'm also super excited to learn more from everyone. Um, and finally, I think <laughs> Michelle said I should mention this. I, uh, I live in a suburb of Boston with my wife and two lovely dogs who were sort of adopted from, uh, from a shelter. So that's, uh, that's probably the most important part of my life. 
So that's all, on to uh, whoever's next. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Chu, and I'm a workforce consultant for Mercer, where I play the role as the Singapore public sector leader. So the other role I play in the firm is um, the job redesign practice leader as well, which is a topic that I'm very passionate about because um, I think that that's actually a way for us to rethink productivity, rethink about inclusivity um, in the workforce. And currently I'm based in Geneva where I'm seconded to the World Economic Forum as a fellow for the Preparing for the Future of Work Initiative. And prior to my move to Geneva, I actually spent a year in Mercer, New York, where I was also focusing a lot on future, re uh, future of work related work. So it's a pleasure to be here. Great, thanks Sarah. I'll take it from here. Um, I'm Juliet. Uh, I am currently based in Chicago as Michelle Sitt. Uh, went to school here, started my career as a management consultant similar to Ian um, at McKinsey, uh, and then most recently founded Opus Search, uh, where boutique search firm that helps strategy operations and finance professionals get connected to roles in the startup and tech spaces. Excited to be here uh, and excited to learn. I'll pass it off to Jeffrey. Hi, my name is um, Jeffrey. So PestNap is a B2B SaaS company. I started PestNap straight out of um, NUS. And uh, we now have about 700 people globally across China, US and Europe. We sell to typically um, corporates with R&D investment and we help them to map out the whole innovation and technology landscape. All right, thank you to all of our speakers for that. So now jumping straight into what everyone is here for, we know that, um, so for all of us, the nature and texture of work has been evolving for a while now. And we can all agree that COVID-19 has accelerated the shift. Um, for the first time, companies of all sizes and employees all around the world are going through a very unique learning curve together. So, so to set the stage for us today, Sarah, from your work, especially at the World Economic Forum, could you tell us a little bit about the term future of work and how COVID-19 has really accelerated the trends? Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. I think um, when we speak about future of work, the, the very common answers we hear is, is tech and automation, the question around, okay, are we going to have ro robots taking over our jobs? Or it could be upskilling and reskilling. And very recently, we hear a lot more on remote working. So future of work is all of these but it's not just these. So similar to how we think about anything or any problems or any essay you're writing, it's actually the five W's and one H of work. So across the entire employment journey, so the, the what, the where, the where, the who, the why, and how. Um, so the pandemic has certainly accelerated technology adoption in the workplace as we turn to digital solutions to stay connected, um, to process work better, faster, and also to help us resolve issues. Uh, one example we see is telemedicine in, in, in the healthcare space. The other one is um, in Singapore, you'll see that um, omni-channel retailing and e-commerce really picked up speed um, post, um, you know, after COVID. And also due to the increased usage of technology, we do expect faster changes to, to the design of work, um, requiring new ways of working and new skill sets. Got it. And um, Jeffrey, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges or changes that this period has brought about for PetSnap? Just seeing how PetSnap has really this global um, presence already, even before, you know, the, the pandemic hit. What are some of the biggest changes that you've seen? Yes. Yeah, I yeah, literally almost like watched the movie twice. So uh, it first hit us um, in end of January because we have a China China operation there. So it first hit China and, and the moment it hit, I think we set up a war room uh, within a management team and then every day and then we start tracking because that was during Chinese New Year as well. So we actually start tracking if everyone is safe logistically through WeChat, through all sorts of communication too. And then we start communicating with them and, and ensure just um, 
ask them to be just just rest assured and wait for further notice. And uh, then we the whole of February and March, I think first two weeks of March, everyone working from home in China. But since then, then everyone has 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 came back. Then, mm. then by the time China everyone come back, then uh, it hit the West again. So my London team and my US team, all uh, uh, the same thing happened again. So I would say, um, so far now entering July, and I'm I'm currently being quarantined in Shanghai as well. I just arrived here last weekend. I think from comparing both sides, my, my our team in 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 both China and in the West, I would say in. In China, everyone almost back to normal. So everyone come back to work, come back to office, and our our team is still have to meet customer to kind of close close the deal. Um, in the West, is still is everyone still working from home. And actually, we just decided for for our London team, for example, we will work from home until end of the year. So mm. the whole um, definitely working from home will be a big shift, especially in the West, and. Um, and need to start doing things differently. So we have our town hall meeting weekly, uh, every Friday. So to make sure on over Zoom, to make sure everyone know what is going on. Um, the the way we work, the way we we interact, everything changed. And we have hire, I think the last 10, 20 people without meeting them in person. So a lot of our workflow has changed in the West, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, we will touch on some of those things that you mentioned uh, a little bit later in today's session as well. So things like, how do you communicate across teams? How do you onboard people without actually having met them, right, during this period? Um, I'm curious for some of the things that you mentioned. So things like work from home, you know, until the rest of this year, uh, for the rest of this year, were these things that you already had put um in, in place uh, in terms of pet snaps planning or did you know the pandemic really kind of force this to happen yeah there was a discussion even before the pandemic hit uh, there was a discussion internally people asking to work from home especially our London colleagues their commit is every day back and forth like three hours average so there was a, a talk there but we never really get to it but because of pandemic <laughs> we make it um, official and uh, mm. and I see that as an opportunity as well. Um, one thing like our London lease is ending in August, and in in London the uh, the lease is expensive. We pay millions a year. That's why we have decided we are not going to renew the lease, save money there, and then keep some allowance everyone to set up their work from home station, and then we start working from home and and the rest of the policy as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think we're, we're starting to see a lot of um, companies around the world start moving some of that, um, you know, in terms of what, what would help um, employees succeed, you know, in this kind of new normal. How can they start working from home in a similar environment as they would have, you know, maybe previously in their offices as well. So I think this is a point that I think we'll touch on a little bit later too. So thank you, Jeffrey. Um, so a reminder before we continue as well for everyone to, to please uh, leave or upvote any com uh, comments or questions that you have in the Q&A box and we'll take your questions shortly. Uh, so now, you know, on to I think a point that many of us are very curious about, right, work-life balance. I think one thing that we have observed is this shift by many companies towards a more human-centered uh, employee policies where individual, physical, as well as mental well-being are now in the center of things. Um, you know, Jeffrey, sorry, if I could just put you in the hot spot again. Do you think that the concept of work-life balance is a unicorn? Can we actually achieve that? Yes, it's, um, it's, it's hard. Definitely one key topic for us and in general, the workplace, as we know, um, mental health, mental wellness. How do you strike a good balance between not, not overwork? Um, especially for some of them, the moment they wake up, they are still in the same space and uh, start working how to switch off. I mean, um, yes, I, I think it's not easy, and um, but I, I think that that can be done. So um, our team internally, we have invite um, like speaker come and share about uh, mental health. Internally, we also giving them a lot of training how they should um, switch off or turn off at home while at home. So have some a little bit of improvement, but I, I do see our workforce in our team in general, they do have this issue, most of them, yeah. 
Mm, okay. Um, Ian, I mean, how have you seen things change at your company and team uh, in terms of prioritizing work-life balance, in terms of prioritizing uh, individual well-being and to accommodate maybe some of the non-work responsibilities we have seen pop up during this period? Yeah, so I guess to set the context uh, perceptive, and I guess you told me before that I've all of my career I've worked at sort of um, Silicon Valley type tech companies. So we had we always had a culture that focused on work life balance. Always had a culture that you know um, empowered individuals to you know work remotely or work from home or you know take time off to take care of kids, bring their soccer games, stuff like that. So that was always already part of all the cultures of companies. Um, but I think even then, there was still a significant shift, right? Because for me, just thinking back to um, pre-COVID, uh, you know, I would work from home maybe once every two weeks, three weeks, and that, that was totally normal. Everyone was doing that. Um, you know, there was always flexibility to kind of choose your own work hours. Um, but now, you know, obviously things have changed significantly. And I think sort of moving forward, same as uh, what Jeff said, uh, our company is also going to be working from home pretty much as the primary mode for all of this year and probably next year as well, depending on how things go. Um, so that was definitely a significant, significant shift. But I think one big other thing that, well, I guess it's related is um, sort of tied into this idea of flexibility a lot more of our work is now being done asynchronously. So in the past, you know, when you're in the office, it's super easy for you to go over to someone, tap me on the shoulder, say like, hey, you know, can we chat real quick or you meet someone in the hallway. And a lot of this, are, you know, right now is not, no longer possible. And in some ways it is actually quite good for us as we figured out how to deal with these things asynchronously. It actually allowed a lot of people, and this is what we're hearing, a lot of our individual team members to sort of create more focus time for themselves, right? Which is really important. You don't get distracted because even if you just have someone pat you on the back, like even though that discussion might take one minute, sometimes it takes you like up to three, four, five minutes, even longer for you to get back into a mental state that you were in. And so this is one of the things that we're trying to focus on because obviously moving to remote, you see somewhat of a hit in productivity. And this is one of the ways to sort of get it back. So that's just a couple of uh, sort of anecdotes. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I suppose it's really the sense of as long as you get work done, right, you will give the, I suppose you give the, the trust, you know, to your the team um, yeah. to kind of manage their time. Right. And, and I think we're also a lot more conscious, and I think this is probably true of everyone, we're a lot more conscious of each individual's personal circumstances. So for, for me, you know, me and my wife, we have two dogs. Uh, and we live out in the suburbs where there's plenty of space. So for us, you know, work from home is actually not too bad. You know, it's really nice. You get two hours back from your commute. But for others, uh, I have one coworker who has three kids all under the age of four. And, you know, him and his wife are both working full time. How do you trade that off? How do you have, how do you have meetings while taking care of this one-year-old kid and, like, you know, the other kid is over there? You know? So obviously much, much different uh, for him. And uh, mm -hmm. For all of us as his co-workers, we have to be understanding what to we'll work with him and make sure that how we used to work together can adapt to this new reality. And uh, I think that's you know one of the good things that has really come out of this is mm. being more connected and being more, I don't know, instead of just being a professional relationship. It, I mean, obviously it was always a combination of both, right? but I feel like now these days it's even more personal than it was before. Mm. Yeah, and I think we'll touch on that point of communication as well, I know, a little bit later. I think that's a really good point. Um, Sarah, I know that you had some views about work-life balance, you know, whether that can actually be achieved. Um, what are you seeing across companies and sectors from where you are in the WEF? Yeah, I think the interesting part is you, we see more uniformity in terms of workplace practices in the past couple of months as compared to um, the past, given that, you know, the entire world is battling against the same adversary. So we see, you know, very similar policies and programs being rolled out um, within a very short span of time. We are all forced to learn how to work remotely, be it whether or not you, you like it or not, because you, you don't really have a choice. You just have to learn how to deal with it. So um, in fact, if anything, I think it has been 
become an unavoidable practice. Um, on a on a day to day basis, I think as individuals, we we now have to learn to juggle between um, work and life. Given that we no longer have that physical boundary, you you no longer travel to a physical location. Everything is embedded into where you live, and um, you know it, so it seems so much more possible to respond to that one more email after hours. You you may potentially feel pressured that you have to answer that because we are in lockdown, right? There's no reason why you couldn't do this. Um, and at the same time, for those who have caregiving responsibilities, parental responsibilities, you are then forced to split yourself into being a, a parent, a, a child, and um, and also living with another set of implied expectations from loved ones saying that now that you're working from home, you should also have time for me for X, Y, and Z. So um, the trick here is really a bit of a try, try and error, I believe, um, you know, drawing that boundary with your colleagues, your, your colleagues and your managers, and also helping your loved ones understand that even though I'm home, you know, there are certain hours that I really have to focus to get some things done. So I do believe that we are still adapting and adjusting in that, in, in that aspect. Yeah, I hear you. I think um, personally as well, just hearing from a lot of people, there's this blurring of the work um, and non-work hours, right? Especially as you mentioned, you are, um, you know, even after work hours, it's very tempting to just reply to the one email and just kind of extend that. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Sarah. I think that's a really good point. Um, just moving on to, you know, now, um, how workforces are really distributed. I think the pandemic has really shown that many jobs can be done remotely. Um, this has, of course, been a huge shift out of necessity to remote work. Uh, but I think it might surprise uh, some of you, as it did me as well, that, you know, it's reading up before this and before the pandemic, uh, only 4% of all Americans were working from home, for instance. And now, of course, the numbers are a lot higher. Um, Jeffrey, I'm just really curious because of, again, pet snaps. Uh, really global presence, you know, even right now you have to manage hundreds of employees across so many locations across the world. Um, can you share what you've learned about empowering and motivating uh, a distributed workforce, especially across different time zones, right? Um, what does effective communication uh, look like for you and your team at PetSnap? Yeah. I mean, what I learned is I, I don't have a life. I start in the morning night until midnight. <laughs> that is my life for the last couple of months. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, communication, I uh, really have to do a lot of communication. Because imagine everyone staying at home alone. You don't have that water cooler moment. And then they, they will form their own opinion and mind. And then the, the only way to kind of diffuse all this is really over communicate. So a lot of written email internally communication, a lot of uh, town hall, virtual town hall meeting, uh, making sure our leaders also touch base with their people every day, have a quick uh, kind of um, one on one stand up meeting. I think that communication is key. I think uh, setting a, a virtual room, a Zoom room there and anyone can just hop in whenever they feel free like a virtual water cooler room. So I think a lot of, I would say one key thing is, is a lot of communication. That, that is uh, at least one of the learning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there some things that have worked really well for your team outside of just setting up very intentional communication practices? Um, Especially, you know, for say a team leader who now has to really not have that face time with his team um, for colleagues who don't get to see one another anymore. Yeah. So I think a common thing our team leaders do is every day, morning and end, end of the day, they will have a, a short team meeting to kind of also have like a ceremonial, like this is the start of the work day and this is the end of the work day. So uh, at the start of the day, have a team huddle together, quick one. And then at the end of the day, have a team huddle as well. So this daily cadence actually help uh, make the team feel inclusive and at the same time also signal that hey, this is the start and kind of the end of the, the work day. It's one small little practice I know our leaders are, are doing. Yeah. I, I think that's a very cool idea actually. Just thinking of how I can actually implement it myself as well. I really like the idea. Um, Juliet, you know, in your work with 
companies and in your many conversations with decision makers, people who are hiring, right? How, what are some of the ways you are seeing them uh, carry out things like onboarding, uh, performance reviews during this period? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, as Sarah said, everyone's still adapting. So I think people are still trying to figure out what works best for them. But at least for now, um, everyone is, for the most part, you know, trying to figure out ways to do this virtually. Uh, especially in the U.S., I think there's a lot of sensitivity around meeting in person. Uh, you don't want to ask because, you know, if they say they don't know how to say no, especially if they might be your junior or subordinate. Um, and so I think at least for now, everyone's just trying to f figure out ways to manage everything online. And I think to Jeffrey's point, it's a lot around just increased communication. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing, um, you know, kind of trends in the way that people are carrying out um, things like performance reviews, you know, where previously it depended a lot on having that kind of face-to-face -face, um, kind of interaction or even onboarding, right? How do you kind of bring um, on board new team members who might not have the chance to meet the other team members for a long time. Yeah, uh, again, not, I think we're still relatively early on in the sense that like everyone's just trying a bunch of different things and seeing what hits or works well, right? So for example, um, one of the big themes is like not being able to meet someone before you hire them in person, which has historically been kind of a huge factor that a lot of people want to do. Uh, and so we've had people, you know, call me and say, hey, I want to meet this person before I hire them. Do you think it's okay if I suggest, you know, we go for a walk at the park or sit on the park bench, right? I think there's a lot of kind of complications around that these days, especially because uh, in Chicago until recently, there wasn't places to meet. And then on top of that, kind of going for an early morning stroll with, you know, if you're an old white man and you're going with a young woman, everyone's going to look at you funny anyway. And so there's a lot of just... Um, uh, people are just calling and having a lot of questions and answers with me around like, what is acceptable? Is she going to think it's a weird suggestion to ask? Uh, and so people are using us as a recruiting firm often as the conduit of like, you know, asking for, um, you know, meetings that might otherwise be seen a little differently. Uh, and so uh, we kind of function as the intermediary. So we might go to someone and be like, hey, are you comfortable to, you know, meet here or this place or that place, right? Acknowledging that you're often going to be in your full mask and kind of uh, trying to talk to someone or for the first time as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does sound like a lot of people are still figuring this thing out. Um, you know, Ian, I want to turn to you on this point on, you know, just very quickly on employee engagement. You know, um, what does it look like these days? How do you maintain this whole idea of company culture uh, remotely? Yeah, so I guess it helps that the startup I'm at right now is relatively small. So we're about 30 people. Um, so I think it probably makes it easier to maintain that camaraderie and uh, constant communication. I think as, as Jeff said, it, it's really all about communication. And one one thing that I guess sort of thinking back, when, when I first joined this company, I was uh, kind of shocked by how much of the internal communication was happening over Slack. So, you know, historically over my career, you know, at Bain, for example, it was no such thing, right? It was everything email, everything's formal. Um, and then in autonomy, it was kind of like in between. And now at my current company, Slack is like probably 95% the internal communication. Email is used almost never. Um, and I think you know, when I first joined, I was like, oh, you know, there, Slack has a lot of pros and cons, right? Um, one of the cons is that you're kind of all, like it's really dif dif difficult to filter like the stuff that you really need. and um, how do you not get overwhelmed by all of these like different channels and all these different incoming messages? But one of the great things about it, especially in a COVID era, is that it really fosters that communication. Right? It it's really easy to just get someone's attention. You know, maybe not immediately, but you know, they'll see it at some point. Um, and I think that's why, as you were asking that question, I was kind of thinking, well, actually, I don't really feel more disconnected from my coworkers than I used to be. Um, and I think part of this is, you know when I was at Newtonomy, for example, we were distributed across the globe as well. And so kind of using Slack and email as the main form of communication was quite normal to me. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I think sort of in the COVID era, you probably, you know, have to over communicate. We do have, we try to be more um, conscious about the ways that we communicate. And I think we have a much more deliberate discussion now these days about what the norms around communication are right so what what is an okay time to 
better contact someone. Uh, 10 p.m. probably better be like an emergency, uh, but you know, within X to Y hours, it's you know, completely expected that you would respond within a certain amount of time. So, so if notes like that, I guess in the past didn't used to be that important because you know, most of us were in the same office together. But um, mm -hmm. these days, I think you need those norms in order to effectively sort of keep your life sane. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, um, you know, just uh, taking this this point on norms a little bit further, right? Um, I just want to jump into the next topic, which is, I think, very close to um, a lot of our hearts, that of uh, diversity and inclusion. So, of course, in many ways, the pandemic has worsened inequality and really highlighted some unequal access to resources. Um, Sarah, I want to ask, in your work, um, what are some of the ways companies can maintain this inclusive work environment, especially now that um, you might not necessarily be able to see people and have certain conversations that are really important. Yep, um, indeed. In the past couple of years, um, we see that there is a rising focus on gender representation in the workplace, um, providing equal opportunities for women. And um, from a client work perspective, we, we help clients by conducting what we call internal labor market analysis to understand if there are equal representation across levels and jobs within an organization. And if we are progressing men and women up the hierarchies at the same rate, um, so we provide recommendations in helping organizations address any gaps. Um, on top of that, we also take uh, pay attention to pay equity analysis, um, same job, same, same pay, regardless of your gender. So we observe all of these, some form of hard wiring to promote women in the workplace. And uh, moving forward, we can expect similar hard wiring efforts to be introduced to companies to address race or in, in fact, um, LGBTI representation in the Western markets, for example. Um, like following the George Floyd incident, unfortunate as it is, um, we see some companies really stepping up. For example, Google has stepped forward um, a couple of days ago to commit improving the representation of underrepresented um, communities by 30% in the next five years. I do think we can expect more companies to follow suit. So complementary to policy related decisions, um, I think that's actually the easy part of the equation. That, that's the easiest part of um, you know, what we need to do. Um, we do need to work on the softer aspects. So for example, speaking about the cultural side of things, um, we will start to see heavier emphasis on DNI as part of an organization's DNA, if not already. So we, we can see investments and in programs to educate people on diversity. And I do see all of these things in the step in, in the right in the right direction. Um, so, but we do think more needs to be done um, on changing workplace behaviors and culture. So simple things like how do we manage work, allocate portfolio, do we give equal opportunities to people regardless of gender, regardless of race, um, you know, regardless of identity? Um, how do we go about managing conflicts and discrimination in a workplace? Um, it's still a sensitive topic. I don't think a lot of people know how to handle it in a way that, that that is palatable yet. And um, the very, very important part here is how are our leaders modeling um, the right and appropriate work behaviors? Are we calling out unacceptable discrimination? Um, are we promoting people the right way? I think all of these things will come to scrutiny um, very, very soon. Mm -hmm. And I do also think that diversity is such a wide topic. We are only scratching the surface with these recent events. Um, it's said that it has to take something for, for people to react. But if we were to think about diversity, it's beyond race, it's beyond, um, it's beyond gender, it's beyond your identity. Um, we also need to think about cross-generational um, work. So how do we start to blend um, you know, workers of different generations together? Uh, if we were to really think about um, the different job categories, so if we look at um, an emerging job such as a data scientist, um, the average age is probably about 30 years old. 
as compared to a relatively traditional occupation like accountants, where the average age is about 44 years, right? Is there a way for us to better blend this mix so that we can then think about cross-exchanging ideas, really guiding our future generation better, and yet, um, you know, getting um, the more maturing workers to learn about the new ideas. So that's something which um, I would wanna, wanna, want us to think about, and perhaps it's something for discussion as well. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, this is a very thoughtful point. Uh, there is actually a, a question that, you know, has been submitted by someone in the Q&A during registration that I think really ties into that. So if I could just go a little bit into the question right now. Um, so the question is really about how the COVID situation um, has really brought about many policy gaps. Uh, you know, to the forefront. So things like secure, lack of secure safety nets for the gig economy, uh, minimum wage discussions, reliance on foreign labor, uh, especially in Singapore. Uh, you know, at the same time, it has really reinvigorated uh, discussion about the ways that countries can reconfigure economic and social environments. Um, so things like investments in green economies and jobs, maybe a four day work week you know, efficiency and productivity uh, centric, technological support for the elderly. So things like that, that you mentioned. So in your opinion, Sarah, um, how likely is Singapore or, you know, or countries as a whole, you know, likely to implement some of these changes going forward? Um, are there other models, you know, or, or maybe countries or economies that could serve as a good benchmark or, or model for us to follow? Um, really great question there. And, you know, if I were to just comment on some of the programs we have in Singapore, I do think they're very rich. Um, the question is, how do we continue to harness the benefits of those programs? I think if we were to really look at, um, you know, some of the new initiatives that came out of the recent budget, um, I do think it is also the step in the right direction. Um, so, for example, we should pay more attention to what we call the vulnerable group, um, where it's likely that we don't even know how to, how to help them to learn. I think, I think that's a big problem we should try to resolve. Um, for a lot of folks on the call today, it's likely that if we were to embark on some upskilling journey, it will get you some there, somewhere. But whereas I do think um, across the board, across countries, um, we should focus on a more concerted effort around addressing the future gaps of the vulnerable groups. And likely, if we, if, if we were to look at the unemployment numbers, the stats, um, it's likely that those who are working in the services sector are heavily impacted by COVID. They are either being placed on furloughs or are being laid off. And it's difficult to really get them to upskill and turn them into a data scientist tomorrow. But how do we then think about a more comfortable middle ground where we could start to have them pick up skills gradually so that they don't continue to be left behind by the society? I do think this is um, one topic that all nations will need to think about more carefully. I think we have good focus on professionals, on emerging skills, um, but it's really those who are vulnerable and currently being left behind by the society. Yeah, I hear you. I think especially, um, you know, the vulnerable vulnerable groups that you mentioned, they are also some of they are also the ones who might face a little bit more um, uh, friction in terms of having them upskill, reskill, you know, be redeployed. I think across sectors as well. So thank you, Sarah, for that. Um, I I mean, are there ways in which you know what are some of the easy first steps that we can take? In that um, sense. If we were to look at some of the European market, the apprenticeship model is actually quite prevalent. So um, a colleague of mine, um, her husband, after years, you know, working in the IT field, decided that he wants to be, um, he wants to start to make wine. And he's actually going through, um, you know, a, a couple of years apprenticeship to do that. So for certain occupations where we don't feel like we need to have, um, you know, graduates to do those roles, I think organizations should start considering um, apprenticeship programs, really reduce the unnecessary bar we have imposed on hiring and get people to, to scale along the way. And that's a way of attracting more people, more talent and minimizing um, the unnecessary gateway we have imposed um, in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sarah. I think that, that's a good one. A lot of food for thought from your responses there. Um, so let's move on to 
uh, the next uh, final topic that we have for the agenda today. I think something which is, uh, you know, which a lot of people are very kind of anxious about because, you know, job security is such a key priority now so, for so many of us. Um, some employees are worried about whether they'll be able to keep their jobs or whether their jobs will even be around tomorrow. Uh, there, are other, there are also others who are thinking of moving jobs during this period. Um, that is already a challenge in normal times, you know, much less during a pandemic. Um, Juliet, you know, this question is really quite tailored for you, right? Just in your role in recruiting and in, in talent search. Um, are there skill sets, you know, or qualities that you have seen to be most valuable or in demand in today's climate? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, generally speaking, uh, at the start of the pandemic, a lot of the jobs that um, went away or uh, people stopped hiring for tended to be jobs uh, in functions where um, success is contingent on spending money. Right? So a lot of times uh, growth marketing type roles, uh, recruiters, right? nobody's trying to grow or nobody's trying to hire anymore. And so those are the ones that you know, people are saying, okay, we're going to kind of downsize these functions. Uh, the flip end is we saw a lot of kind of uh, necessary, you know, more necessary to the functioning of a business type of roles still stay around. And so, for example, um, a common one was a lot of people are saying, hey, I still want to hire my controller, or my accountant or my FP&A person. I still need a lawyer um, for my company. And so I think there is just a temporary kind of um, divide where people are saying we are so uncertain and we don't know what's going to happen to the company and whether or not we're going to grow. But we know we still are going to be around as a company. And so the roles that we are looking to recruit for are going to tend to be roles that are more on the back end and uh, pertaining to operations, reducing costs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Are there any niche verticals that you're seeing right now that are very much in demand or that have, you know, really sprung up? Yeah. So not necessarily a lot of, um, so again, I think the, the primary one that surprised me was, you know, uh, we do a lot of finance recruiting. And so um, a lot of people were coming to us uh, instead of your traditional corporate development strategic finance roles and saying, hey, you know, can you hire an accountant or controller instead? Uh, I think beyond that, uh, in the US especially, the diversity kind of in and inclusion officer is a big one that has sprung uh, out of recent events. And so we don't do as much of those, but that's definitely something that um, we're seeing a lot on all the job boards these days where I think companies are starting to prioritize and say, hey, okay, we need someone in here. We need to invest kind of resources uh, and manpower if we actually want to solve or fix any diversity related uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely a step in the right direction in uh, my opinion. Um, so in this really crowded kind of market space now where so many things are uncertain, if, if you know, I, I were a talent that would be putting myself out in the marketplace right now. What were, you know, what are some of the kind of like top tips that you would be giving me to help make myself kind of um, stand out, differentiate myself? Um, how can I really nab a role even during this period? Yeah. So our general advice as a company to all the talent and candidates that we work with these days is if you don't have to leave yet or you're not laid off, right, or you don't, you know, there's no burning desire, I think just wait it out a little bit simply because um, the level of supply in the market today from a candidate standpoint is just overwhelming, right? Uh, a lot of people have gone laid off. A lot of people are looking for jobs, um, but uh, kind of the... Uh, a uh, number of jobs have kind of gone down, so people are hiring less. Uh, and so what that creates is an environment where I could post a role tonight on you know, LinkedIn and tomorrow I'll be overwhelmed with 300 applications. Uh, these are numbers that you know, uh, nobody has seen in the past. And so there's just increased number of competition uh, for the same type of role. And I think Ian can probably echo that if you've done any hiring as well. And so our general bit of advice is like, if you are going to be recruiting, like, um, you know, some of the people that I've seen do it the most successfully are ones that treat it like a full-time job and you have to, you know, spend your six, eight hours every day kind of trying to network, get your name out there because uh, at the end of the day, you're one out of 300 that might be competing for the same role. Um, Ian, Jeffrey, you know, just being in the positions where you are meeting candidates, um, thinking about filling in positions uh, for your company going forward. What are some of your thoughts in this, in this regard? Uh, 
Um, maybe I'll take take this first then. Um, yes, it's um because of this change in the um working from home. I think from a, from a company perspective, we do definitely see or anticipate that. First of all, I think the good thing is the the talent pool will be much wider for us because currently uh, we are not going to be restricted by by geography. So for us, we can actually hire across the whole US, the, uh, or theoretically the, across the whole Europe. Um, but at the same time, um, new um, new challenges may come up. So for example, like Facebook and other big tech company, at least in our space, that means they're also competing with you globally as well. So, and then that boils down to still from a employer, from a company perspective, we still need to do our part to make, for example, our company mission, vision, exciting for the candidates to join. We have to have a good career growth plan. So all these other things that in the past that um, is still important and maybe more more important than ever. So this is my thought on at least how, how PassNet we look at how go about recruiting good candidates and retaining good candidates. Yeah, so I think this is probably one of the ones where because my perspective on the market is probably quite narrow compared to a lot of the, you know, the, the other industries. Um, it, it, it seems it seems a little bit different from, from, from what I've been hearing. Right? So specifically the type of uh, people that we're hiring, say, you know, top AI, ML, you know, machine learning engineers, or like top neuroscientists who have PhDs in very particular fields and like, you know, work experience in CS, like these people, because I guess the, the pool is so small, um, it, we haven't really seen like a huge change. And in fact, um, probably the competition for these folks has only intensified. I mean, just looking at the Boston area, uh, one company that we go up against pretty often is my former employers or the economy at fifth day, uh, just closed like this huge joint venture that was like $4 billion a few months ago, and now they're expanding hiring. And so it looks like the market is getting even more competitive for us. I mean, obviously this is not true of, of every, a player in the market, you've seen layoffs in certain parts of it, but I have, for the most part, not really seen uh, a huge uh, sort of like glut of, of supply um, on the talent side. It's it's been pretty um, e even for some of those like you know sometimes I look on my LinkedIn network, there are people who have been laid off. You know, if they you know write a post about it, and then pretty soon after they're like, oh, I found a job at like this new place. It's, you know, I think it's um, probably quite different from, from most of the, the, the rest of the economy. Right, yeah, thank I, you, Ian. I was gonna say, that's that's a good point because I think the caveat to that is like the more niche your skill set is, then, you know, the relatively insulated you are from the effects of, you know, uh, overcrowding in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, you know, just on that point, um, I think a lot of people are wondering, you know, how they can actually build up um, resiliency, even during this period, improve uh, career mobility. Um, Sarah, Juliet, do you guys have any kind of tips for them? Yeah, so I think in terms of, um, I, again, I think to Anne's point, right, I think the, the more niche or more specialized you are as kind of a, a candidate, then the more, you know, someone is going to be um, wanting to hire you in the sense that uh, if I'm a consumer company, um, right, or help a lot of consumer companies hire direct-to-consumer kind of e-commerce brands, a lot of times the people that they're going to prioritize out of a list of, you know, 10 or 20 that we send them are going to be the ones who have done the most kind of relevant work to what they're doing. And so I think if you are trying to build up resiliency or maybe, you know, you're trying to look at the end of the year, I think things that you can do is try to start carving kind of a path or getting closer to the industries or fields that you might want to be in down the road so that you can at least speak to it knowledgeably, right? So if I'm trying to work at, with Ian, I might want to, you know, maybe, you know, try and raise my hand for any projects that are related to AI or ML, at least to have some baseline understanding so that when I get in, you know, an interview with him, I can stand out in that way. 
-hmm. Yeah, and in terms of um, so writing on that, so on, in terms of resiliency, um, there are actually a lot of thoughts on this. If you were to just Google it, it's like be mindful, be proactive, be positive, don't be negative. Um, all of these are all true, but I would I actually encourage people to think about embracing what we call the unsuccessful moments and not to quickly label it as a failure. It is a learning, it could be a good lesson or a bad lesson, but oftentimes I think we're so quick to label an outcome as failure that we don't take enough time to reflect on the journey two or three layers deeper. Like, you know, are we really understanding the circumstance or, you know, have we reviewed the factors that are both controllable and uncontrollable and looking for ways to enhance it? So I do think this is a way for us to grow and build resilience through that. Mm -hmm. Got, got it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Juliet. Um, I think we have time for one question from the Q&A uh, section. And thank you all so much for all of your very thoughtful comments and questions in there. I think the top upvoted question is one on cultural differences when we talk about the future of work, right? Um, so Sarah has actually said that you know, future of work conversations are becoming more normal in the West and more common. Is there a corresponding conversation that's happening in Singapore as well? Um, she has heard from her friends and so on that, you know, instant responses at all hours, even when your colleagues and your bosses are reaching out to you. Um, I think even at midnight, it's all considered very normal in Singapore. Whereas this could be considered inappropriate or even toxic in the US and in the UK. Um, what are some of your thoughts? I guess this is an open question since we're all Singaporeans and we've, I guess, had some working experience in both, in both places for some of us. It's hard because I think it has to be acknowledged as an issue and then um, tone has to be set from the top down, right? If I'm like an analyst joining a company and my boss is saying, hey, I need this at 10 p.m., uh, it is unlikely that I'm going to say, no, I'm going to do it the next day. Uh, and so I think the U.S. has, while it's not perfect, at least in certain industries, they have uh, tried to make strides uh, in terms of, you know, uh, setting a tone with leaders and saying, hey, um, you know, maybe you should think about prioritizing work-life balance and not, you know, asking your employees for things on the weekend. And I think over time, as that has become more and more ingrained, uh, then people at the bottom, as they start to rise and become managers as well, they try to comport to those standards. Yes, I, I think this also really highly dependent on, on the boss and the company culture. I mean, different company context is just different. For us, um, definitely before candidates join, we will let them know the expectation, whether it will be <laughs> it will be working like this or not. So, but just our experience in China, our colleagues definitely work, work, work very hard. Over weekend, uh, we, I usually spoke to my colleagues until 12 midnight. In, in the West, relatively speaking, in Europe, um, definitely, uh, it's more weekend, it's more in general, the world for general understanding that weekend is more on their own time. But um, when you recruit candidate, we say that sometimes also weekend have to work because we are a startup, we still need to survive. So I think it's just different company have different culture. I think from um, before joining the company, just check with the recruiter or the or the potential future boss, right? What is it like? Just as long as managing the expectation, right? I think that is at least one thing can be done. Mm -hmm. So having sort of managed a team across sort of Singapore and the US historically, I can say that there are definitely pros and cons, right? So in the US, um, I at least am very appreciative of having that sort of delineation between work and personal life and uh, having sort of more more I guess sustainable lifestyle but then again I also see the downsides to it right so I, I haven't been part of a 996 culture before but um, uh, you know I can see the distinct differences in sort of responsiveness and maybe even sort of just um, uh, pure amount of work that gets done between you know someone who's based in Singapore and someone in the US and that's kind of like a trade-off that uh that you have to make right so when we were a small startup and uh you know 
survival is at stake. You know, we were working a lot longer hours, regardless of whether it was Singapore or the US. But then as you get bigger, you have sort of more stability, you have more, you know, still a startup, but you know, a thousand person startup at some points is, starts feeling less like a startup and more like a big company. And so, you know, you have to, the type of people, at least historically that I've seen, the type of people that you're bringing in, it's going to be slightly different from the type of people that you bring in when you're 10, 10 person company. Um, and so you just need to adapt uh, to the changing sort of circumstances of the, of the work environment and the, the stage of growth that you're in. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. So to just wrap things up on a bit of a positive note, uh, let's do a rapid fire round uh, with this question on silver linings, right? What has been maybe one good thing vote wise that has come out of this period that you hope will continue even, you know, when things have quote unquote normalized? Sarah, do you want to start the ball rolling? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think two things that, you know, really, really came out during this period was um, the first is the unity of the society, like how organizations came together, people came together, coming coming out, you know, different ways to give back either to the society or people, people around you. So I, I really hope that spirit continues. Um, the other one which I have really been very impressed about is um, our amazing ability to adapt. So like, I, I, in the beginning, I was talking about if we were to just reflect on the past couple of months on your individual journey, I think you'll be very amazed by how much how much you have experience and um, hopefully with that it pushes forth more innovation we can expect to see in the future and you know we will be more looking forward to embrace new changes that will come our way uh, I, I can go next My, mine is really just work from home love it thriving. <laughs> uh, I would do would love to go into the office or once or twice a week, but I can definitely get used to a work from home. Mm. Yeah, yeah, same. I echo in. Uh, I think that's a big, uh, when we first started our company, you know, we were going to be a remote first company for the sole purposes or selfish purposes of like me wanting to be able to work from back home in Singapore for a couple of weeks a year, right? And so it would be hypocritical to not allow your employees to do that. I think moving to a more kind of remote friendly kind of culture across um, is just beneficial for a lot of people. Yep. Yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I echo Sarah's sentiment as well. I think I, definitely there are positive things came out of this while under this very, uh, a lot of uncertainty uh, geopolitically between the US-China trade war, pandemic and all this um, going on. And we, we still don't know how it will end up. Uh, I think as long as um, that there's always the positive side to it as well. I always see that the coin, there are two sides of the coin. Yeah. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, guys. I, I really agree with your point on um, working from home. It's a, still a little bit of a struggle to, I think, differentiate between work hours and non-work hours, but I think we're getting there. <laughs> so hang in there, everybody. So that wraps up our main event today. Uh, I had a blast and a big thank you to our four speakers, Ian, Sarah, Juliet, and Jeffrey, for their very interesting and thoughtful insights. Uh, we do have a a feedback form that we hope you can, you know, just take some time to share with us your feedback in. And uh, next, for a really exciting invite. So the Singapore Global Network runs Tech Plus 65, which is a community of tech professionals who are interested in Singapore's tech landscape. So if you are interested in connecting with other tech folks in Singapore and around the world, and you have at least five years of ex working experience and above, please scan this QR code, code that you see in the slide here to apply to join. So I've seen some of the conversations on Slack and I can vouch that this is a pretty amazing network of tech professionals with a wide range of backgrounds and interests. So we hope to see you on the network. And yeah, so that wraps it. Uh, we hope you've all enjoyed the session. Thank you once again to our four speakers for being such engaging, lovely panelists with us here today. And we hope to see all of you at the next event. Take care. Thanks, guys.
Thanks. Take care. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Bye.